So hey guys, welcome to our channel Fiction Domain. And also welcome to the another amazing story on what if Naruto had the demonic magic power and become a devil. Here is short summary. He had saved his dimension from perilous doom at the expense of his own life. He resigned himself to his fate and accepted it, but to his surprise, he is flung through time and space into a new world as a child. His memory stripped away from him and his sense of self quashed. Naruto is forced to change his outlook on what it meant to be a hero. Sometimes a hero must become the devil. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. 2095. Uzna. Department of Defense. General's Office. General Anderson was a decorated war hero, he had fought and won dozens of battles during World War III. His contribution to the war was so important that the president of the UNSA himself took to decorating him. Such an honor was given to very few soldiers. After the war, he quickly rose the ladder until he eventually gained an executive position in the Department of Defense. Ten years ago, the Dodd signed off on a covert unit known as Oni, it involved the training of magically attuned children before making them ready for covert missions. At first, he never questioned where the children came from, and all he could tell was that they were vastly more powerful than the average magician. The total of 20 children were inducted into the program, and only five remained. Each of them possessed talents that made them one of the most important assets that the Uzna had. From the age of 5 till 12, they were trained in theoretical magic knowledge, combat styles and military tactics. The knock on his door snapped him out of stupor, he said gruffly, come in. Boy Anderson Gigi I want a mission. If Anderson could groan he would have, but he needed to remain professional. The boy in front of him was one of a kind, his genetics, his mind and even his personality were something that they had never seen before. He was briefed on the boy's life, a life filled with poverty and strife. Despite remaining so upbeat, one who was experienced in reading people could easily see the loneliness in his eyes. The boy's origins were unknown, they had no clue who his parents were, but Uzumaki Naruto had shown them that he possessed unparalleled power. Aside from his magical abilities, he wielded a special form of energy that the boy called Chakra. Every attempt to replicate it had seemingly failed, it became clear that the boy was unique, and even more than that a scientific impossibility. He was an anomaly present in this world, one that could send the world spiraling into havoc. Luckily for them, he had taken a liking to Anderson, and even though the old general would never admit it, he saw the young teenager as a son. Anderson took a puff of his cigar, you just came back from Belarus, Naruto. You need some time to before I can brief you again. But I am so bored. You keep me holed up in my room anyway. Anderson sighed, your so cold room just so happens to be the size of a hall. I can't give you a mission. But Levi Chan got sent on one yesterday and she came back after I did. He sounded like a whining child, but Anderson saw the predatory look in the boy's eyes. He did have one mission. But he wasn't sure whether the Dodd would allow for such a long-standing mission. Ah, what the hell the boy did need a serious break from this line of work. I do have a mission. It's long-term. The 15-year-old immediately stood ready and attentive, he said, what's the mission? Anderson smiled and Naruto looked at the sinister smile warily, oh, I am sure you will love it. Damn bastard. The old man had sent him off to school and in Japan no less. On top of that the dot had restricted his use of several of his most powerful magical abilities. Those damn bastards were seriously looking for a fight. The second he had arrived there, he was sent through dozens of checks and long interrogations that were designed to see whether he was a spy. Of course, their feeble mental interference spells didn't even scratch his mind, he was trained to withstand illusions that felt so real that they were capable of distorting your entire perception of reality. Anderson's contacts provided him with a nice home in Hachinjai, Tokyo, where he would then go on to take the exam. Details of all the procedures to all the class setups were sent to him. By the end of the week, Naruto had already formulated a plan to be as inconspicuous as possible. First High School. The first high school is affiliated with the National University of Magic. It is an upper-level magic institution known to send the most graduates to the National University of Magic every year. At the same time, it is also an elite school that churns out the largest number of excellent magic technicians. In regards to magic education, there is no official stance on providing an equal opportunity in education. Japan didn't have such a luxury unlike the Uzna, the numbers of talented magicians in Japan were between far and few, and so the government was forced to comprise between making all the students happy or to churn as many talented magicians into powerful soldiers. They unsurprisingly chose the latter. Naruto had gotten to school early, it wasn't his intention to simply stand and talk to the students like all the others that had gotten there before him were doing, no, he didn't want to converse with a bunch of children that possessed some sort of superiority complex. 
He was here to do a tour of the facilities and to scope out anyone who he believed to be a threat. It was Covert Tactics 101, make sure you are accustomed to your surroundings or else it can be used against you. Isn't that kid a weed? He's early. He sure is enthusiastic for a reserve. In the end, he's just a spare. Is that another weed? Naruto turned to the group of three gossiping about him and a boy that was seated on a bench. They simply snorted and began walking away, he held back the urge to disintegrate them. Course 1 and Course 2, otherwise known as Blooms and Weeds. It was how the high school system separated those with talent and those without talent. Naruto could have easily topped the exam but chose a subtler approach, if he had failed in a sense and became a Course 2 student, he would have less eyes on him and if there was more to this mission, he would have more freedom. Naruto walked up to the teen and asked him, do you mind? He looked up at him with apathetic eyes before he lightly shook his head, Naruto smiled and took a seat next to him. He unzipped a book from his bag which made the teen look at him with slight surprise. It came as no shock, it was rare to see people possess paperback books. Almost everyone preferred to use tablets to read their media. Naruto preferred real books rather than their digital counterparts, he felt more in touch with the story and the alternate reality that the author was trying to portray. Naruto introduced himself, my name is Naruto Uzumaki. The boy replied, Tetsuya Shiba. His voice monotonous and Naruto sensed a lack of emotion in his body. Naruto frowned slightly, this flatness of tone, his lack of micro-expressions and slight edginess, had put Naruto into a state of wariness. He had met a lot of people like Tetsuya, magicians were weapons to a lot of nations, many underwent a process that removed their emotions or at least reduced them to a put where they didn't feel anything when fighting. Such an enhancement may have not improved upon the magician's likability, but instead made them unstoppable soldiers that could kill men, women and children without hesitation. They were in effect the perfect soldiers, ironically, they reminded Naruto of a man that did the same thing. Naruto sighed before returning to his book. Ten minutes had passed and he realized that it was time to go to the auditorium. He stood up and began to walk into the direction of the main hall, in truth, he was avoiding the person that was coming towards Tetsuya and him. Sugaisa Mayumi. He wanted to avoid interacting with the Ten Master clans as much as possible, if he got ousted her as a spy, he would never be able to return to the Uzna. Tetsuya Shiba let out a small breath as he saw Naruto walk away. Tetsuya had fraught monsters of all kinds, his magic had made him almost unstoppable in the field and yet he felt so uneasy around Naruto. It reminded him of them. Are you a new student? It's almost time for the ceremony. As Tetsuya was logging out of his reading portal and about to stand, a melodious voice spoke out to him. The slight glint from the sun streamed into his eyes as light was reflected off her bracelet. He thought, Cad. Cad's aka casting assistant devices were a spell support processor. In modern magic, Cad's replaced the need for spell invocation and long chants, Cad's worked by simply storing activation sequences for spells. This in effect worked to simplify spell casting. General purpose Cad's could store a total 99 activation sequences, whereas specialized ones were said to only be able to store around 10, although there was slight deviation in the numbers. His eyes traveled to the eight-pointed star on the left side of her uniform. His thought cad and of course one upperclassman. He stood up a little straighter, thank you. I'll be on my way. He watched as her red blood eyes traveled down to the emblemless badge on his left chest. Her facial expression remained the same, signifying that the revelation of him being course two students didn't stir up any feelings of superiority. She said softly, I'm impressed. A screen type. Virtual terminals are banned, so screen type devices are the only thing we are allowed to use. It's nothing that is worthy of praise besides the virtual terminals are not suitable for reading. He justified his reasoning and it caused the girl to giggle slightly. Her eyes twinkled even more, instead of watching animations, you prefer to read. That is quite rare. It wasn't really. Even though in this era many preferred to watch animations rather than read books, it wasn't rare to see a person reading. What was rare was reading paperbacks as opposed to reading them on tablets. Ah, I have yet to introduce myself. I'm the student council president, Sugaisa Mayumi. Nice to meet you. Tetsuya frowned, he thought, a number. And to top it off a Sagusa. Hmm, it seemed that high school may be a tad more troublesome than he imagined it to be. He had already gotten the attention of one of the clans belonging to the Ten Master clans. It was a well-known fact that magician's ability was affected by his or her heredity. The Ten Master clans represented the most elite magicians in Japan and arguably the entirety of Asia. The Sagusa was one of two houses deemed to be the most powerful in this country currently. Mayumi was probably an elite amongst elites and he was the complete opposite. He noted that he hadn't introduced himself. I'm no, my name is Shiba Tetsuya. Her eyes widened slightly and she mostly connected the dots between his connection to her. Shiba Tetsuya-kun, I see so you're that Shiba-kun. He was the older brother of the freshman representative, Shiba Miyuki. 
She had aced her exams and became the top entry for this year. You've been a hot topic among the teachers. She thought, well you and that foreigner. It was probably due to the fact that there was such a large rift between he and his sister in terms of magical ability. She was a prodigy and he barely passed. Out of a hundred marks, the average marks of all seven subjects in your entrance exams was 96. Especially outstanding were magic theory and magic engineering. Even though the average marks of those who passed was no more than 70, you received a perfect grade for both subjects that had difficult essay-based questions. It's unheard of record high. That Saya felt rather awkward being showered with praise by the student council president, this was not going as he had imagined. He pointed to his left chest showing off his emblemless badge, those are merely paper tests results. They are just data inside an information system. In this world, my scores don't matter. Practical ability trumps theory. She shook her head and said, that kind of terrific score, at the very least, I wouldn't be able to reproduce, you know. He hardly doubted that. I may not look like it, but I'm really much stronger in theory-based subjects. If my entrance exam had the same questions, I definitely wouldn't be able to score such a high mark like you, Shiba Kun despite her cheery attitude, Tatsaya understood what she was trying to convey. She was telling that even he had scored poorly on the practical part of the examinations, he had a unique skill set. In a way she was saying that he shouldn't feel inferior to his sister. He bowed slightly, it's about time. Please excuse me. Auditorium. Tatsaya strolled into the building, and he immediately noted that more than half the seats had been filled. There were no seating arrangements, and as such it was possible to sit anywhere you liked. However, there was unspoken and almost law-like designation that was present in the school. The first half at the front would be taken up by the blooms. The students who wore an eight-petaled flower emblem on their left chest. The half at the back belonged to the weeds, students who were nothing but reserves and would most likely either become magical engineers or low-ranking magicians. Even before they were officially enrolled, they were already cleanly divided into these two groups. One believed themselves to be superior than other. He thought, the people who were the most conscious of the discrimination accepted the discrimination, huh? It was a kind of common sense. He cared very little to try and rebel against the convention present within the school and so took to looking for open seats at the back. His eyes traveled to an open seat right at the back, it was two seats away from Naruto. It was the first time that he had gotten a good look at the teen, Naruto was definitely not Japanese and was most likely a mix between Caucasian and Japanese heritage. He possessed spiky red hair with blonde tufts and electric blue eyes. As he took his seat, he managed to sneak a look at Naruto's book, Discourse on the Origin and Basis of Inequality Among Men. The author was French and by the looks of it, it was a rather old book. Perhaps he had finally met a fellow intellectual. Naruto's electric blue eyes traveled to meet Tetsuya's gaze, the boy was busy trying to observe and read him. He mentally shrugged before returning to his book. He had read up on all the current students at the academy, well, he had hacked into the school mainframe, but his year were technically not enrolled, and so very little data was there. Both Naruto and Tetsuya had the same thought, that they were going to do a background check on each other. Naruto then looked at the clock, TCH. Another 20 minutes more. He wanted to call Anderson right now and tell him to assign somewhere else. He didn't care if it was fucking Siberia, this place was boring as hell, and he knew that it would probably remain the same way for the next three years. Err, is that next to you occupied? Naruto looked at the girl that was speaking to Tetsuya. Tetsuya was seated on the far right, three seats away from him. Then no be my guest. She said apprehensively, thank you very much. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the fact that she wore glasses. Another girl sat next to the one wearing glasses, she had the same blood-red colored hair as Naruto but brownish eyes. Tetsuya and the two girls introduced themselves. Tetsuya returned to looking forward, and Naruto wanted to return to his book, but the red-haired girl kept staring at him. Naruto said almost with an annoyed tone, what? Aren't you going to introduce yourself? Yuzumaki Naruto. The re-dared girl chuckled, your parents named you after a Raymond topping. He replied dully, wouldn't know, they died a few hours after I was born. Her eerily cheery voice seemingly died to a somber one. She said apologetically, sorry I didn't know. It's not a big deal. I never met them. Um my name is Shiba Erika. He didn't care. The girl with the specs also introduced herself, I'm Sabata Mizuki. He stared into her eyes and almost dropped his book. God damn it, why did one have to be in this school? Glasses were rarity in this era, many new vision correctional procedures had become widespread in the last 50 years, and so the condition known as myopia had been all but resolved. Some people were too poor to afford treatment, considering that she got into this school meant she was not that poor. Some possessed a power similar to his, their eyes were extremely sensitive to spirit particles. It was a rare condition and sometimes presented itself to be a nuisance, but it was a very valuable asset to possess. 
Sions and Pushions were particles observed in parapsychological phenomenon, which included magic. They were comprised of non-physical entities that not like fermions or bosons, but something else entirely. Sions were particle manifestations of thought and intentions, whereas Pushions could be thought of as the particle manifestations of the emotions that arose from thought and intention. Her eyes could perceive these particles to such a degree that beyond that off the average magicians, it made her a liability, and no one could find out his secret. If she did. He didn't want to think about it. Naruto tuned out the world as the young Chiba began to converse with her friend and Tetsuya. Miyuki Shiba's speech was the only fascinating thing that had happened in the past hour. Despite addressing some of the more important issues about first high school, particularly, the discrimination and segregation of students. Naruto realized that the students were more interested in her apparent beauty than any message she had tried to convey. Naruto was sure that she would become very popular among the students. After the orientation, they were all instructed to stand in line and get their ID cards and timetables. It's Ayakun, what class are you in? Erika asked. 1E. E. His tone suggested that he would rather be anywhere except here, but the two girls remained oblivious to it. Yay. We are in the same class. Erika hopped up and down happily. She seemed to be overdoing it but, I am in the same class as well. Naruto tried to walk past the group of three, but unfortunately Erika noticed him, he said quickly, I'm in class E as well. There were a total of eight classes ranging from AH, and each class had a total of 25 students. The blooms occupied the AD, and the weeds were placed into classes ranging from EH. It was ordered in terms of magical ability, and the H class were the worst. Naruto sighed even more, perhaps he should have scored lower on the exams, so he could be placed into the H class. The blooms were taught by instructors whereas the weeds were taught via video animations. Tetsuya kun Do you want to go check our homeroom? Naruto felt a vibration in his pocket, he sighed as he quickly ducked between a group of students before calmly and briskly walking into a deserted corridor. He took out a device and to the people of this era what he had was very very old technology. Brick phones went out of production over 70 years ago, and so nobody used them, the Uzna however had buckets of them. They contacted their overseas agents via one of these, it was more secure than a digital terminal. The Tsai watched Naruto stealthily sneak away from them, Erika and Mizuki didn't even notice that Naruto had seemingly disappeared. He narrowed his eyes slightly, but nonetheless returned to Erika's question. Sorry. I am supposed to meet up with my sister. Sister? Um is your sister by any chance the freshman representative, Shiba Miyuki? Mizuki asked. Yes. Eh? Really? Then, are you twins? The question from Erika was a natural one. To Tetsuya, it was a question that he had heard since young. I have often been asked that, but we are not twins. I was born in April while she was born in March. That aside I am surprised you even made the connection. Mizuki seemed to be nervous about the sudden praise, but she replied, um your demeanor, or should I say both of your auras are very alike. Tetsuya narrowed his eyes again, she was very dangerous with those eyes of hers. Hours later. The Zama Technologies. Tokyo. The Zama Technologies was a rather large technology firm, they were known for making specialized CADs and weapons for military contractors. What many didn't know was that they also sold CADs to the criminal underworld. Of course, the criminals were smart enough to actually register as real clientele, which reduced the likelihood of the DI or the JSDF finding about their underworld contacts. Hanzo Kazama was a retired magician who had spent a large part of his 20s and 30s working as military engineer, he quickly rose through the ranks and worked on a multitude of confidential projects. He retired soon after a mishap occurred on one of a jet he had designed and it killed a pilot. Hanzo was never a patriot, nor was he someone who believed himself to be a saint, he was a businessman and a very crude one. He knew that one day that his past would come up to catch up to him. He was currently situated in his office on the 20th floor. His office was a very spacious and was one of four offices that filled the uppermost floor of the building. As the CEO of the business it wasn't rare that he would leave later than most of his employees. A lot of his R&D staff did long shifts that went deep into the night. Ring. The elevator rang abruptly, and Kazama narrowed his eyes when he didn't hear a single footstep. He reached underneath his desk and removed a specialized gun cad and pointed it at the door. Why do they always think I am going to come through the front door? Hanzo turned and saw what could only be described as a demon. He saw a hooded figure in front of him, the figure was wearing a kitsune mask. What freaked Hanzo out were its eyes, they were blood red with multiple concentric ripples, and nine tomios ordered in a random sequence between each ripple. He instinctively jumped back, but the figure grabbed him and pushed him onto his wooden desk. Normally I would just kill you, but my employer wants answers. A few months ago, you sold a shipment of CADs programmed with the activation sequence of lethal spells to a group hold in Belarus. Who were they? I don't know Atch. 
The figure's gloved hands began to choke him. He saw the fear in the Hanzo's eyes. I hate doing this. His gloved hands touched the man's scalp and he began to rip out the man's soul. A purple ethereal energy was absorbed into him and the figure's eyes rolled back slightly as a flood of the man's memories began to rush into his conscious mind. He took out a brick phone and dialed a number. I know where they are. Sending you the group's coordinates. You know Levi Chan if Anderson knew what you were doing. What he doesn't know won't hurt him a feminine sing-song voice echoed from his phone. More importantly, I need the money. Her voice changed almost immediately. It was true Oni was the most secretive unit there was, they didn't exist on paper or off the books. If the Dodd was found out to have taken in children and experimented on them before turning them into an elite ops force, they would most likely be very large repressions on the Uzna. They were paid very little by the Dodd, and many of them had taken to become mercenaries off the books. Anderson had warned them to stop, but none of them did, they just became more secretive about their extra circulars. Criminal or military, it didn't matter to him. The lines good and bad had been blurred for many years, and now the two terms overlapped. In this world, one could never be a hero without being a monster, and that was what he was. Very well. I, Naruto-kun. His eyes stared at the dead man in front of him, if the medical team were to examine Hanzo, they would rule out any foul play being involved. Naruto sighed and moved the dead body to the floor before accessing the holographic computer on the desk. He had some work to do before he was done here. His wrench ring and glow dread as he analyzed all of the complex code and data, he was committing terabytes of data into his long-term memory. It would be half an hour before he was done, and just an employee came to check on the boss, Naruto disappeared in a space-distorting vortex. Shiba household. Hitsaya Shiba was busy trying to investigate about Uzumaki Naruto, and to his disappointment, he had found absolutely nothing. Naruto was a definition of a ghost, he had come out from nowhere. In this era, the amount of people that could stay under the radar without military protection were infinitesimally small. Technology had evolved to the point that it was impossible to remain under the radar, your face would be recorded by cameras installed all over major cities, and bar teleportation, transport systems required data about the user. Tetsuya knew for a fact that no nation had managed to even pass the experimental stages of teleportation technology. So how did a high school student become a ghost, his grades were suspiciously around 1% below the average grade for both written and practical tests. Oni Sama what are you doing? Miyuki asked as she entered his lab wearing a simple white robe. She walked up to the screen and saw Naruto's face. Who is that? She had yet to meet Naruto in person, Naruto had disappeared suddenly and had never returned. Yuzumaki Naruto. He's in my class. She began reading the data on the screen and looked at her brother strangely, he seems like a normal student to me. Yes too normal. On his second screen, he was running his name through every database he had access to, and once again there was not a single match. She lay a comforting hand on his shoulder, perhaps you should give him the benefit of the doubt. Yes. I might just have to. He pressed a few buttons on his keyboard, and all of the pages were closed. He resigned himself to the fact that there was an unknown present in his class, and so long as he remained cautious that Uzumaki Naruto, if that his real name, would present himself to be no trouble at all. He would protect Miyuki with his life and if Naruto decided to harm her. He would disintegrate him. Back with Naruto. In a dark room, a single photo of Tetsuya Shiba was shown on a very large screen. Computer code was surrounding the entirety of the image. Naruto grinned predatorily, so that's what you are, Tetsuya Shiba. His high school may be more entertaining than he thought it would be, and he had found just the person to play with. March 4, 2095. It was known that operatives preferred to work alone, they could infiltrate groups and countries more easily if they worked alone. Technology and magic had allowed for countries to have tighter security, and many countries had very harsh laws on tourism and migration, Japan was one of them. After World War III, certain countries like Australia had closed their borders. They still actively worked on trading with other nations, but with the existence of magic, they were more independent than they have ever been. The fall of the Commonwealth and with the United Kingdom choosing to become a part of the West EU, Australia found themselves to be alone. Considering its remote location, it was relatively easy to spot any threat to the country. The pan followed suit, they closed their borders and aggressively vetted all incoming persons, but there were rules that Japan had to follow written by the International Magic Association and the United Nations that was now more of a defunct ruling organization that only the West really followed. The pan had to allow traders and merchants through their borders, and it wasn't rare to find a child born from Japanese businessmen or women to return to the country and begin his education, in fact, Japan strongly advised the parents do that, especially if they possessed innate magical abilities. Using this loophole Naruto constructed his entire persona on life, he claimed to be a son of a businessman who had recently passed away. 
They vetted his so-called family and checked his financial records, finding them to be incredibly vast, Naruto was allowed into Japan on the condition that he attended school. Of course one would wonder how Naruto fooled one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world, the answer was ironically technology. Naruto was indeed wary of anything being traced back to him, he laundered everything in through shady Yakuza businesses and several shadow criminal companies that he had made allies of. The JSDF didn't have any strategical type magicians equivalent to the Oni. Of the five of them, the weakest was capable of causing havoc on the battlefield with his odd ability of human puppeteering. Naruto shuddered slightly, who knew that another version of Sasori would be birthed here. His TV blinked on and on it appeared Levi and General Anderson albeit, on different screens, Anderson said, I trust you are fitting quite well in Japan. Naruto nodded, with the exception of the constant boredom, I believe I am doing fairly well. Levi said, you know perhaps I can fly over and help alleviate your boredom. And risk a nuclear cataclysm, I don't think so. Anderson said, I am sending Levi to China. The both of you will work hard to earn the trust of the targets I have informed you about. Naruto merely saluted and Anderson blinked out, Levi gave him a Cheshire grin and said, I know that look, Naruto. You're up to something and since you haven't told Anderson, I can only assume it's somewhat shady. Let's just say Japan has become slightly more interesting, Naruto said with a slight smirk. So, what is your mission? Levi chuckled slightly, infiltrate a magic university in China and gain access to their military database. Apparently, the Great Asian Alliance has been stealing tech from the Uzna. Why do you get all the interesting missions, Naruto said with a hint of annoyance. Levi's lips quirked, you want to talk, you get all of those merc assignments. Believe me, assassination missions are far more fun than infiltration ones. Anyway, I must get going now if I am to catch my flight. I sent you some paperwork that I need your help with. I'll get right on it after school. He said the word with a slight distaste. He switched off the channel and began to get ready for yet another boring day at school. First high school. Naruto sighed as he eyed the classroom for the corner of his eyes, he chose to sit at the back in the furthest corner from the door, he did this to avoid any sort of interaction with Mizuki, the girl's unique ability to sense his Sion count was disturbing, and since he was still working on his Fuinjutsu. He hadn't found a way to seal his Sion count or at least lower them to someone possessing Spanish pesetas. Despite the outward jovial appearance of the classroom, he found a slight depressing undertone in the classroom. It appeared one day in this school was enough for the weeds to understand the extent of the discrimination in this school. Now he wasn't saying the Uzna was any better, but there were no such divisions in classrooms back home, it was more of an ability gap, with those who were considered A-class or S-class magicians being taken to work with the stars and the dot. His research here was that magic was more familial and inheritable in the sense that each family or clan decided to use a unique type of magic to make themselves stand out in the populace, and as such those who were members of the ten master clans were given a higher status than the general magician populace. It instilled some sort of holier-than-thou feel to the whole community, and Naruto hated it. He abhorred it. And not for the reasons that you would think. According to certain protocols the course 2 students were given limited practical skills training, as opposed to the course 1 students, this, in turn, furthered the discrimination. The rationale behind these protocols didn't elude him, but rather he found the way it was set up to be irritating. Even though his interference strength and Sion count were extremely potent, he found that his chakra tended to cause a lot of what could be called normal magic to go haywire or be too powerful something that he was only able to hide in the practical exams by simple luck. It required intense training and years of understanding and experimentation to explore the interaction between chakra and magic, but such was the complexity of chakra that he found that it worked in both an astral sense and a physical sense, despite this setback he had found that the best way for both to work harmoniously in his body was chakra control exercises. Naruto was so enamored with his thoughts, he never noticed a young lady addressing the class about counseling and registration of electives. As he began to return to reality, he found the lady staring at him, she gave a quick smile as if she knew that he had not been paying attention. She said, for those who have already finished registration as well, it's fine to leave. However, you may not do so after guidance has started, so if you wish to do so, please leave now. If that is the case, please don't forget your ID card. Naruto simply stood up and walked out of the classroom, he found everyone looking at him, but he couldn't seem to find in him to care. He had never exactly been a conformist. The scraping of another chair indicated that another student had also chosen to skip the guidance part of the session. Naruto sighed, guess I'll go check the library. They may have some sequences I can copy. Elsewhere. Itsuba clan manor. Itsuba Maya was known to be one of the most powerful women in the entirety of Japan and even the world, her notoriety was not only gained by her dangerous magical ability, but the wealth of information she possessed no thanks to having access to Echelon 3, a global monitoring system. 
A knock on her office door and her butler walked in, I have the information you wanted, Mayasama. A folder was placed on her desk and she opened the binder, pictures of what could only be called a massacre were uncovered. And this is what the Belarus government said happened. What about the operation? Destroyed. It appears that the death of Hanzo and the uncovering of our operation was no coincidence. Maya frowned slightly, this isn't the first time this kind of attack has happened. York, Moscow, Brazil, China and now Belarus. It appears there is a mysterious organization in our midst. The butler asked, but why did you ask for this boy's file? Maya pulled out the file and said, because he is of interest to me. He is in the same class as him, is he not? I saw his scores they don't look very promising. Maya merely smiled in a dismissive manner, the butler understood the call, she wanted to be alone for now. Maya typed a few things in her terminal, and a picture popped up, a picture of a nine-year-old Naruto walking out of a mafia hideout, and a police report on what had occurred. The whole thing had been classified and scrubbed by the Dodd, and had she not had access to that backdoor, she would have never found it. Because sometimes the devils you seek disguise themselves as the weak and frail. She mentally answered the butler's question. I wonder what you are Naruto. She would find out in due time, she thought as she sipped her expensive wine. With her weapon and first high protecting Miyuki, she knew that Naruto wouldn't be able to hurt her, but she had a hunch that that wasn't the point of his incursion into Japan. She guessed he was most likely an operative for the Dodd. The smile appeared on her face, it was devilish as she said softly, let's see what your game is then. She would use the back door as a means to observe his actions in real time whilst he was in the school. Arena. Naruto trudged across the field and towards one of the practical sessions that he wanted to observe, battle magic was an elective that the school allowed for both course 1 and course 2 students to take. It involved training students in the use of weapon cads, basic casting strategy, duels and many other aspects that would help those who wished to move on to the National Defense Academy. As he neared the arena he found himself watching Watanabe Mary use self-acceleration to avoid her opponent's spell, the boy merely tracked her trajectory and aimed his cad at what he assumed to be her landing spot too slow. Naruto thought. Mary landed just before he could launch the spell and in effect accelerated herself towards the boy. The next thing he knew, Mary was right behind him, an activation sequence already up. The boy chuckled, your win, Mary. Mary looked at the large group of bystanders, every year this elective was by far the most popular, and as was tradition, it was common for the top duelist to duel some of the first years. Anyone else want to have a go? Mary said. No one raised their hand, Naruto understood why. It was idiotic, Mary was a very powerful tactical magician. Mary said, then I will have to pick one of you. Everyone became slightly anxious, Mary scanned the crowd, and her eyes fell on Naruto's. She thought, isn't that the foreigner that Mayumi was talking about? Let us see what all the hype is. You. She pointed straight at Naruto. Naruto merely smiled as if he knew she was going to pick him. As the crowd parted for Naruto, he heard the whispers of all the blooms, saying how easy it would be for Mary to beat him. Naruto walked onto the carpet, he noted several racks of weapon cads around. What are the rules? No lethal spells, but apart from that everything else is permitted. An eerie grin appeared on his face as he picked up a bow staff, he spun it for good measure. Very well. The boy that Mary had just versed said, I shall referee this fight. Both Mary and Naruto stood opposite each other and bowed. The boy motioned with his hand to begin, Mary burst forth intent on finishing Naruto as quick as possible. Naruto simply hopped to the side as Mary appeared behind him, she was forced to duck as his bow staff was thrust towards her neck. She thought, a warning shot. He's telling me not to underestimate him. She activated her cad and was intent on knocking back Naruto, as he now began to go on the offensive. She was unprepared for him to once again maneuver out of the specified coordinate of the movement type spell. Impossible. How could he have known the parameters of my spell? Naruto raised his bow staff and struck the ground, come on Watanabe senpai, I expect better from you. This is child's play. Yeah. Beat the weed already. They heard from the crowd, she glanced at where the voice came from, but was unable to discern as to whom had said the derogatory word. Focus. Naruto was already on her his bow staff was already coming down and onto her head. She sped into him and delivered an uppercut. Fast. She thought as she barely skimmed his chin. She grabbed the bow staff and used it to reel him in. Her cat had already activated another attack, a burst of pressurized wind struck Naruto, and he was launched into the wall. The students clapped as if she had already won, but Naruto merely stood up, he cracked his neck, allow me to return the favor. She could barely react as he thrust his palm, he muttered, Futon. Gale palm. An insane stream of wind struck at where Mary was currently located and swept the area. Shit. At first, it seemed like it was a localized attack, but as the pressure of the wind began to expand, she found herself being swept into the air, despite accelerating away from the main focal point of the attack. 
She landed painfully on her back, and as Naruto rushed towards her intent on finishing her off, the bell for lunchtime went off. He chuckled, saved by the bell senpai. He extended his hand to her, and she grasped it as he helped her up. Guess I went a little too far with my wind attack. Mary simply gave him an awkward smile, I wasn't expecting it to expand like that. It was my fault for underestimating it. You give yourself far too little credit. Most people wouldn't have been able to discern the area of expansion. If this were an open arena, you would have surely dodged it. He said. Despite his assurances, Mary narrowed her eyes at the redeed, she could have sworn that she did not see an activation sequence when he launched the spell. He was definitely far more powerful than he let on. She turned to address the group of students huddling around the dojo, guess that covers the demonstrations of this elective. Make sure you have registered before the end of the school day. A clap resounded from the blooms and the weeds before they began to file out of the room. Mary turned to ask Naruto a question, but found the boy had seemingly disappeared. She asked her colleague, where did he go? Neither of them noticed that Naruto had simply just mixed in with the crowd and disappeared. The boy asked, I think you should get him to join the public moral committee. Mary frowned, guess we'll just have to see. But from what she could see he enjoyed fighting more than he enjoyed stopping it. Pantene. Erika said, you should have seen it, Naruto was fighting Mary. It was like he was toying with her. Erika seemed oddly happy about it. Hitsai replied, you said, he attacked her with a wind-based spell. So he converged the wind into a single focal point and then released in the form of a wave. Erika nodded, he ran the calculations in his head. To generate that much pressure in a short amount of time as well the area of effect, it would be classed as high-level magic. Impossible for a course 2 student to do. It once again verified his theory about Naruto hiding his true magic ability. He would, of course, need to see the activation sequence to be sure. After school. Naruto yawned as he walked across the courtyard towards the gate to leave the school when he spotted Tetsuya, Erika, Mizuki, Miyuki, and Leo being approached by a group of blooms, among them was Morisaki Shun. Naruto shook his head, he didn't want to get involved. He heard Mizuki say, we are all freshmen. You guys are blooms, but right now just how are you any better than us? He applauded the normally shy girl for her courageous behavior, but also wanted to tell her that such actions were foolish. Shun shouted out, if you want to know just how much better, I can show you. Using his family's infamous drawless technique, he drew out his pistol cad and pointed it at Mizuki. Naruto sighed, guess I might as well join the fray. Perhaps you should think about what you are doing, Morisaki. You are violating school rules after all. Naruto said. The weeds don't get to tell me what to do. He activated his sequence, and Naruto watched as Erika disarmed him with her baton. She said with a grin, at this distance, it's easier if I use my body. She felt a breeze as Naruto quickly grabbed Morisaki and threw him over his hips and into the ground, holding his wrist he put him into a painful wrist lock. Without your cad, you're not much are you Morisaki. Damned weeds. Two other boys activated their own spells and aimed at Naruto who released Shun and moved to intercept. Stop. A girl screamed as she activated a knockback spell to hit both students who were about to attack Naruto and Ko. Hitsaya noted that Naruto would be able to stop the boys, but the girl would launch the spell, and if he moved to intercept the girl, the boys would launch their spells at Erika. He would need to move as well to stop the girl. Miyuki looked at her brother as he was about to activate an acceleration spell to speed over there. Stop right there. Using attack magic on others for any reason other than self-defense is not just a violation of school rules, it's a criminal offense. A Sion bullet was released, and the girl's activation sequence was shattered. The boys froze and as such their spells were negated as they didn't complete their activation sequence. Naruto thought, great Watanabe Mary and Sagusa Mayumi. The last two people you want to come across in this situation. You are students from 1A and 1E, aren't you? I will hear you out. Please come along. Mary held an activation sequence that was ready to fire at any given time. Naruto analyzed it and smirked, it was the same attack she used on him before. Hitsaya stepped forward and said, I apologize, the prank went too far. At those unexpected words, Mary's eyebrows arched up. Morisaki's quick draw is famed, so I asked him to give a demonstration for future reference, but it became too lifelike and got out of hand. So why is Morisaki on the ground, and why did the girl from one activate a magic sequence? Naruto intervened, that would be my fault, I mistook the situation for an attack and quickly defused the situation without the use of magic. Itsaya continued, and she was taken by surprise. Being able to start up activation processes as a conditioned reflex is truly worthy of a first course student. Naruto merely snorted, this guy was truly a good actor, and his sarcasm was, even more, praiseworthy. Mary understood what he was doing, your friends were attacked by magic, and you still intend on saying this was a prank. Even if you call it an attack, all she intended to fire was a flash of blinding magic. 
It wasn't on a level where it could have caused blindness or impairment. Oh, revealing a skill already, Naruto thought. Everyone in the courtyard seemed to be slightly shocked that Tetsuya could do something that was considered impossible. The girl said softly, how could you have known that? Mary was slightly impressed, so you can read an activation sequence before they have been deployed. Tetsuya said stoically, I'm no good at practical magic, but I'm confident in my analysis. You also seem skilled at subterfuge. Mary analyzed the situation and thought that considering no one had stepped up to dispute Tetsuya's testimony, it would be pointless to arrest any individual. Mayumi said, so this was all a training exercise for you, Tetsuya-kun. Mary shook her head and said, since the president seems so inclined to let you all go, I'll look the other way today. She turned heel and took two steps before coming to a stop, your name. Shiba Tetsuya, class 1E. He said smoothly. I'll be sure to remember it. She then remembered that this was the best time to talk to Naruto privately, but her momentary discussion with Tetsuya had only led to the disappearance of Naruto. God damn it. Naruto merely whistled to himself as he walked around the corner. With all their attention at Tetsuya and Mary, it was very easy to slip away. Tokyo. Midnight. Naruto found himself at an upscale bar restaurant located on the highest floor of Tokyo's foremost hotel. He sat on the table that was booked for him by one of his new clients. I hope you didn't have to wait very long. A gentle feminine voice spoke from behind him. As she took her seat, Naruto finally had a good look at her. She was a woman of immaculate beauty and looked to be in her late twenties, she possessed silky black hair and stormy gray eyes. No. The woman barely nodded, I am sure you know who I am. Of course Aori. I am aware of your current predicament in Tokyo, with the Blanche managing to take over, your business is suffering. And? Naruto smirked as he withdrew a small scroll from his pocket and slid it across the table, I wish to extend a helping hand. Sayori opened the scroll and her eyes widened, but this is. The way out. He said as he leveled his gaze at Sayori. Sayori asked curiously, what is your game? You could sell this blueprint to the military for billions. Let's just say you and I are the same, we resent the Japanese government. This weapon will help even the playing field with you and the magicians that are currently undermining your operation. Sayori smiled sinisterly, very well. She extended her hand and Naruto shook it. To our partnership. They both said as their meals had arrived. What about the more powerful magicians? Naruto's eyes flashed red, I'll deal with them personally. A grin played on his lips, all was going according to plan. With the Blanche beginning to make their move, Naruto would help the Black Lotus in succeeding the group. Tokyo. Councilman Daichi was what you would call an extremist, he believed that the only way to stop all the violence was to conquer those that threatened Japan. Of course, such an ideology was incredibly foolish, but it worked in the favor of those who wished for power, namely, the Itsuba clan. It turned out that in exchange for getting him a chair in the parliament, he would have to push a few laws that the Itsuba. So, it came as no surprise that Council Daichi was quickly made the replacement after the untimely death of the current Minister of Defense. And here he is, the new Minister of Defense, Councilman Daichi. The news reporter spoke as Daichi walked down the steps of the National Diet Building. As he walked down, he was bombarded with questions. How would you address all the critics saying that you are unfit for the job? Is it true that the only reason you got the job was because you have connections with the Ten Master Clans? Daichi stopped in front of the crowd and said, I believe wholeheartedly that I can fill the shoes of the previous Minister of Defense. It is true that my role in the government was as a councilman in the House of Representatives, but I was a lieutenant general in the JSDF before that. Were you not dishonorably discharged from that position? Daichi rebutted, I was proven an innocent part. It all happened so fast that no one including the police were prepared for it. A single bullet ripped through the air and struck Daichi dead in his forehead. As the news reporters fled the scene, the police quickly looked at all the vantage points in the area, and from the looks of it, there were too many to count. By the time the police had placed a five-block barricade, the shooter was long gone. Three miles away. Naruto merely chuckled as he stood upon the rooftop of a hotel, he was wearing his standard merc uniform, and in his hand, was a sniper. With the role of magic, the use of snipers became more widely known and spread, you could shoot a target two miles away if you had a good enough vantage point. He grabbed his cellular phone and said, I believe I have fulfilled our end of the contract. Sayori's voice could be heard, that you have. With Councilman Daichi dead, the next Minister of Defense will be one with a grudge against the Ten Master Clans. I'll wire the money. Naruto said, okay. His phone began to beep, and he checked the time, class would start in 30 minutes. I need to get going. He hung up the phone and disappeared in a vortex. Things were beginning to come to head, and the occupants of Tokyo better be ready for the incoming storm. 
Naruto warped into an empty room at the school. One of the more advantageous aspects of chakra was that it was an incredibly esoteric energy form, as such it was impossible to detect through the normal instrumentation used to enforce magic cues. Of course, that wasn't to say that it was impossible to detect, especially if one were paranoid enough to observe any change in the environment. He had no doubt however that very few people possessed the resources or the energy to commit to such tight security measures. A quick change of clothes and Naruto found himself walking into the classroom, which was thankfully full. That way, he wouldn't have to deal with the constant bombardment of questions that the others would no doubt send his way. Though that didn't stop many of them from looking at him. That Saya's eyes narrowed as Naruto sat down, there was something off about him. It wasn't magic, but it felt more or less the same, like a bloody cloak wrapped around his body. He had no choice, he had to use it. That Saya let out a shallow breath, his eyes closed before they snapped open. The world around him dissolved into a colorless dimension allowing him to observe the information dimension. His gaze fell upon Naruto and to his surprise, he found no change in the idos or fluctuation in Sion. Tetsuya sighed, perhaps Miyuki was right and that he was simply being paranoid. He shut off his elemental side as the bell for class to begin rang, never noticing the red hue that bubbled forward from Naruto's form. Naruto bared his teeth angrily, he had almost been exposed by the bastard. Perception-type magic at its highest form was capable of perceiving Eidos in its entirety, and since Eidos was simply the information body of an object it wouldn't matter if Tetsuya had ever seen Chakra before, he would have easily been able to observe the energy. Naruto found that he had no choice but to quickly draw a sealed diagram to suppress his Chakra. He wanted nothing more than to bleach. Great just great. Now I have to deal with two sensors. And worse yet, he couldn't change classes either. He was literally stuck with them for the rest of the year, or at least till they had a proper examination, in which he was determined to fail, so he could go to the class below. Then again, Naruto wasn't sure if that would make him more or less suspicious. The JDSF really did train you well he thought. The information that he had collated was mostly circumstantial, and if Tetsuya was a part of a project similar to Oni, then he was sure that there would be no way to verify this without actually confronting Tetsuya himself, something that he'd rather not do until he learned what ability he had that made the JDSF so protective of him. Beep beep. Naruto annoyedly looked at his terminal that began to blare, notifying him and the others around him that he hadn't logged into to start the lesson. Logging in, Naruto immediately scrolled through the contents of the lecture, a basic theory on the four classifications of magic and their uses. How boring. He was sure that the Blooms would be getting an in-depth analysis of each classification, as well as actual practice on how to use them, Naruto smirked when he sensed an overall increase in animosity around the classroom. It appeared that he wasn't the only one who thought what a waste of time class was. And people wonder why organizations such as the Blanche thrived so much in countries like Japan. It was all so amusing and frustrating for Naruto. Deciding to pull a Shikamaru, Naruto rested his head on his terminal and promptly fell asleep. Wake up. Wake up. Naruto found himself being shook awake, his eyes blearily took note of short red hair belonging to Chiba Erika. He groaned, is class over already? Erika smirked, already? You've been asleep for the last 50 minutes. She leant in with that usual condescending look, long night, Yuzumaki. Naruto raised an eyebrow, yeah, you could say that. He looked around the empty classroom and muttered, why didn't you go with the others? You're the only one who picked battle magic. She shrugged, it wasn't like she knew him enough to be his friend or anything. He rose from his seat lazily, well I guess we should get a move on then. He logged out of the terminal and made his way out of the classroom with Erika. Awkward silence loomed over the pair as they made their way to the practice room. Erika couldn't stand it and kept throwing sideway glances at Naruto, who was still tiredly rubbing his eyes. What? He deadpanned. Nothing. She quickly said, chuckling awkwardly. It's just, I was curious about that spell you used against her. Naruto shrugged, it's just a simple convergence and dispersion technique. I simply compressed the air and released it in the form of a wave. It's a very common technique back home. Home? She questioned. Naruto nodded, yes I'm from the Uzna. Unlike Japan, where familial magic specialites are given precedent the Uzna prefer to create generalists, so we learn a lot of different techniques, though in time, it becomes apparent in what area you excel at. Erika frowned, and what area do you excel at? Naruto chuckled, him as I said, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none kind of guy. That's why I'm a weed and not a bloom. Her eyes lit up slightly, does that mean, you know a lot of spells? Can you teach me some? He didn't have the time to answer as they entered the practice room, though calling it a room wouldn't do its sheer size justice. The room was as big as a hall, its walls were stripped bare, and the only components present were racks of generic cads on the wall. Naruto and Erika stood at the back, behind a few dozen students who were listening to a rather old man at the front. Welcome to Battle Magic. 
This elective focuses on the application of magic in combat situations, as such it is necessary that each of you all are familiar with the theoretical basis of magic. There will be quizzes every other week. Naruto heard many of the students groan, failure in these quizzes is not tolerated. So, pay attention in your other classes. The old man gazed across the room, there are 36 of you, I have assigned placed you all into groups of four. Find your group and await further instruction. Each of the students looked a terminal in front of them and scanned it for their name. Naruto let out a sigh of disappointment when he realized who was in his group, Shibamayuki and Erika were both in his group. The last member was someone that he was unfamiliar with, but judging by her name, it was a girl. Erika smirked, looks like we're together. Yes unfortunately. He muttered. As the students began to shuffle around, Naruto saw Miyuki walking towards him with a rather short girl. Miyuki smiled politely, Yuzumaki-san, Erika-chan. Naruto peered at the last member of the group, you must be Kideyama Shizuku. The girl nodded, and you must be Yuzumaki Naruto. She added monotonously. Naruto grinned, I think we'll get along just fine. Shizuka gave him a weird look, but made no effort to speak again. The two silently watched as Erika and Miyuki began chatting until eventually the teacher began to speak. These are your groups. He said. They are mixed for a reason, two from course one and the other two from course two. The students began to whisper about how unfair it was that they had to be paired up with weeds. In this sense, I expect each of you to be respectful of your partners because as you well know, your grade depends on it. Naruto could almost see the old man smiling at the Bloom student's anger. The student raised their hand, but what if we fail because of our partner? The teacher sneered, this is the nature of battle, your life is in the hands of your partner, just as much as their own is on yours. If you are too afraid, you can just as easily change to a different elective. The student remained silent amongst the snickers of his classmates. If there aren't any more questions, I would like to begin today's lesson. He began by calling out group A, the group was split into pairs that were asked to fight each other. It ended rather one-sided as the course 1 overpowered the course 2 student with particular ease. After each fight, the teacher would ask the class to break down what happened. This pattern continued, and the blooms began to take pleasure in beating the weeds. Erika muttered, is he trying to get people angry? Naruto replied, he's trying to motivate us. Anderson Jiji used to do the same, when they had begun their training, they were always paired up against magicians that were at least several tiers better than them. But with each defeat, they become better and better until they eventually surpass them. Then again, most people weren't enhanced to become literal war deterrents. Group D. Will you please step forward? The teacher nodded briefly at the four of them, though Naruto was sure he was just interested in Miyuki and Shizuku. Erika Chiba will face Miyuki Shiba. Yuzumaki Naruto will face Kideyama Shizuku. All four bowed towards each other, the rules are simple. No fatal magic or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Everything else is permitted. The terminal blared and began to count down from five. Three, two, one. Naruto immediately jumped as Shizuku aimed her pistol-type cat at him. She fired several volleys of compressed air at him. Naruto dodged each of them effectively, he grinned as she continued to fire volleys at him, but to no avail. Shizuku frowned, he was fast, probably on par with elite magical athletes. Naruto cast a sideway glance towards the Miyuki and Erika fight. It ended as quickly as it started, Erika was rooted onto her spot by ice. The teacher announced, Miyuki wins. Shizuku snarled at his apparent disrespect, he didn't think her enough of a threat to warrant all of his attention. She raised her gun again, this time several portals appeared above Naruto and fired several volleys of air towards him. Naruto grabbed his weapon, a sheathed katana blade that gave off a very ominous feeling to the people in the room. The teacher narrowed his eyes as he watched Naruto dash towards Shizuku with an axle spell, the girl was alarmed by his speed, but managed to still aim her gun towards his chest. Naruto gripped his sword in Iedo style and unsheathed it, Kinjutsu. Shikasaki Zeku. In one fellow sweep, his blade swept across the air and cut through it. What an idiot, he missed. The class snickered as they sent snide remarks at Naruto. However, both Miyuki and the teacher knew that Naruto's technique was just invisible. Shizuku felt the impact of something ripple through her being, her mind went blank from the pain, causing her eyes to roll back and her body to crumble, as if it were being held by strings. Naruto sheathed his blade, I believe it is my victory. Why yes the winner is Yuzumaki Naruto. He stuttered out, shocked about what had just happened. The other students of the class appeared equally as shocked as him, silence reigned, many couldn't believe that a weed had just between a bloom. Miyuki shot him a curious look, that technique was eerily similar to her family's specialty of mental interference magic. It made her both afraid and more interested in the boy that she had written off as just an average student. She watched as Naruto kneeled down and gently pick up Shizuku, apologies, sensei I may have gone a little overboard. He chuckled nervously, can I take her to the infirmary? The teacher nodded. Before you go, would you tell the students what kind of spell that was? 
Everyone became curious. Naruto shrugged, a little trick I learned from a samurai. One of the students snorted, samurai don't exist anymore. People say the same about shinobi. Sure the profession may be outdated, but there are still a few practitioners around. So, all you did was kenjutsu. The teacher sounded disappointed, Naruto knew what he wanted him to say. That it was a form of mental interference magic, but to admit to that would be akin to committing seppuku. If the Itsuba heard that there was a new MI user around, they'd stop at nothing to bring him into the fold, and if that failed, they would try to get him killed. Do you really think a course 2 student is capable of mental interference magic? The teacher nodded at Naruto's reasoning. Very well. He turned away and called the next group. The class continued as if nothing had happened, they all just chalked it up to a fluke. However, Naruto was unable to sway Miyuki. The fact that he lied what the technique was had made her even more suspicious of him. Could it be? Could Naruto be like Tetsuya? She shook her head, there was no way anybody was like her Ani Isama. Itsuba Maya was furious. Her sponsor had been assassinated, Daichi's agreement with the Itsuba ensured her even greater power than what she currently had. But that plan had all been but destroyed by a sniper. Beep. No match. Maya slammed her fist against the terminal in pure frustration, her backdoor to the Echelon 3 had given her nothing. No chatter whatsoever, these people weren't intent on celebrating or even proclaiming that they had killed the councilman. The video chat call appeared on her screen, Maya answered it with annoyed sigh, Raymond what have I told you about calling me? Raymond Clark was the son of Edward Clark, the inventor of the Echelon 3, which served as a worldwide information gathering network. Raymond, like his father was an expert at computer hacking and database manipulation, so it came as no surprise that he found the backdoor. Boss Maya would never admit it, but if it hadn't been the bothersome child the backdoor would have long since been patched. Despite this, Raymond's method to conceal their activity was to make it appear as if they were authorized users of Acholian 3, as such all of their searches appeared in the public domain, something that the other sages used to taunt each other with. The pleasure is always, Maya. Raymond said teasingly, I see you've been busy searching about one of our own. Yuzumaki Naruto, is it? Maya gritted her teeth, I was merely being cautious. But not cautious enough for me to see that you've accessed the DOD's files about an incident that he was involved in. Raymond chastised, for a boy that was in high school, he could really be condescending. Bet to the point. She said. I did some digging, Yuzumaki Naruto was merely at the wrong place at the wrong time. The DOD's interest in him is due to his ability. Ability? Energy manipulation. Raymond clarified. I presume you've heard about superpowers like pyrokinesis and psychokinesis. Naruto possessed the ability to manipulate energy without the use of activation sequence. They dismissed him once they discovered that his ability was incredibly limited, he could only manipulate only a few kilojoules, and only for a short period of time. Furthermore, genetic analysis proved that the trait wasn't hereditary, so there was no way to further enhance or implant into another subject. Maya frowned slightly, that would explain why he is in course 2 and why there wasn't any more data on him. But she was still not convinced that the boy wasn't hiding something. In any case, I have more pressing matters to attend to. Raymond smirked, ah the assassination of your puppet. He began typing on his terminal, the sniper took aim from three miles away. It's consistent with any long-range magician sniper in the army. You might have to look closer to home. Maya asked, what do you know? Nothing. Raymond said honestly, well besides the fact that the next in line is a Fujiwara, and they have a huge grudge against the system that has made their nobility fall from grace. Maya hummed in thought, so it's likely we are looking at anti-magic I swear if this is doing of that monkey. Raymond laughed at her cluelessness, not as much anti-magic as they are against the power of the Ten Clan. He heard a distant shout of his name, good chat, Maya. See you when I see you. He said as he shut of the channel. No matter how much she wanted to kill Raymond Clark, he was always a great help even if she didn't understand why he wanted to help her. After all, Japan and the Uzna weren't exactly on the best of terms. Then again, no nation was. World War III had made everyone paranoid. She picked up the visor and entered the back door once more. This time searching for organizations or people of note that had voiced their hatred for the Ten Master Clan. Her lips tightened when she saw how long the list was and how powerful many of these people were. She sighed tiredly, today was not going the way she wanted it. Naruto had gotten carried away, the thrill of fighting had led him to use chakra, thankfully they all remained in the dark, but he had to make sure that it never happened again. After he finished placing Shizuku in the infirmary and informing the nurse what had happened, Naruto decided to beat the lunch line by a few minutes, instead of going to class. The day marked the first day of what he liked to call club recruitment week, like any other school, first high school was thoroughly invested in extracurriculars. But if what he had heard from Anderson was correct, they took recruitment to these extracurricular clubs far too seriously. 
apparently, the major magical schools in Japan often came together to face each other in competitions, and winning or losing these competitions either boosted or worsened your reputation. So, the school invested a lot of money into these clubs. They grabbed the burger from the machine and slowly began to eat it. The bell rang for lunch and as one would expect, a rush of students came into the canteen soon after, all looking to get lunch and head outside to explore the different clubs that the school offered. Well, it wouldn't hurt to see. Surely there was a club for people who didn't want to be in clubs. Oh god, I'm turning into Shika. He smiled sadly, even though his memory wasn't completely back, he could still remember a life in a different world. The life where he had friends, where he could be naive and normal, it all felt so far away and hazy that he sometimes thought that it was a mere figment of his imagination. Naruto stepped outside and was impressed by the sheer size of it all, tents covered one school ground to another, it almost made this place look like a festival. Seems like there's a festival going on here he muttered. Art club no. Music club no. Who even creates a sculpture club? He wondered. His gaze finally fell upon an empty looking tent, named the literature club. He smiled, found it. There was a single girl in the tent, she looked like she was going to die from exhaustion. Naruto walked up to her and said, is this the literature club? The girl lifted her head tiredly, yes our club offers, she was about to drone off when she noticed that he didn't really care. Ah you're one of those. Naruto smirked, I figured, I'd find a club of people that don't want to be clubs. She muttered, well I wouldn't really call it a club, we have a dozen or so members, but they never turn up to anything. So you set this up all by yourself, must have been exhausting. She gave him a deadpan expression as if she was saying no shit Sherlock. Naruto said, say can I join. Name? Uzumaki Naruto. She wrote it down and gave him a sheet saying that she accepted him into the club. Well if you are interested in the club, the details of our supposed club hours and meetings should be on the sheet. Naruto muttered, thank you. As he trudged off. That was easy, he thought. Even though he felt bad for that girl, she really needed to get some sleep. He wondered if she also didn't really care for the club, but was instead more interested in just getting some extra points to get into university. Hey you. Naruto spun around and found two men wearing a guy approaching him. Would you like to join the mixed martial arts club? So, this is what they meant by aggressively approaching students, he wondered how many first years caved and just joined anyway. He shook his head, sorry I just joined the literature club. We saw you fight Mary. One of the boys said, a lot of our members are second core students, as the Blooms prefer joining martial art clubs that involve magic. We need someone like you, who can stand up against them. Stand up against them? They like to bully us, take over the dojo when they want, whenever they get the chance to undermine our legitimacy, they will do so without hesitation. Naruto growled angrily, he had just about enough about this school's blatant discrimination. If they wouldn't even let people practice their own craft in peace without disrupting them then they needed to be taught a lesson. Lead the way. The two boys gave him a thankful smile as they led Naruto to the gym. When they entered Naruto saw many different martial art clubs, giving demonstration to crowds of first-year students. This is us. He whispered to Naruto. Naruto entered a rather spacious room connected the gymnasium, the center of the room contained a boxing ring, and around the room, there was various equipment for training, such as a punching bag. You guys do boxing. The boy smirked, among other things, I train students in Jai Jutsu. The other boy said, I teach Judo. What style are you most comfortable with? He lied, it's not so much a style as I am just good at brawling. The boys nodded though they looked somewhat disappointed. You said something about other clubs causing trouble. I'm sure you'll get a good see for yourself soon the two boys walked towards the mat and introduced themselves, Naruto watched as they showed the different techniques and training regimens that they teach in the club. He was impressed, both students were high-level practitioners of their art. Shinji used a mixture of Brazilian and Japanese jiu-jitsu, whereas Atsushi who had the build for wrestling, primarily used a mixture of American wrestling and judo. In a world without magic, they would be a frightening pair to go against, but alas martial arts proved off little use against magicians, unless you were quick enough to grab them before they activated their CAD. Hence why grappling styles took precedent over striking in this current climate. The students clapped, and Naruto could see a few stars in their eyes, it was a rather dazzling display, many students were wholly unfamiliar with styles like jiu-jitsu and judo, preferring to train in weapons, rather than hand-to-hand -hand combat. Naruto's eyes narrowed as the door slammed open and a group of newcomers entered the room. It's our turn, Shinji. Shinji sent him a look before turning to the intruders, we have the room booked for lunch, you can have your fun after school, Aichi. Do you think anybody cares about your mixed martial arts club when they could join our club? Aichi sneered. You couldn't best even our worst member in a fight, magic trumps all. Shinji laughed mirthlessly, I've beaten you every time, Aichi. Or did you forget who won in the national championship? 
Ai Chi gritted his teeth, those non-magical competitions mean nothing. You would have lost if I were allowed to use my Kaijin. Naruto grinned sadistically when he heard what the boy's style of fighting was, Kaijin or otherwise known as Titan, was a mystical martial arts style that involved the use of fortification magic around the body, however unlike the phalanx or Leo's panther. Kaijin made them slower and heavier. They sacrificed speed for strength and endurance. Then perhaps a wager if I can beat you using your Kaijin, then you will this club alone. Naruto said, stepping forward from the crowd. Aichi took note of Naruto's blank shoulder emblem and laughed, a weed wants to challenge me. Shinji stood steadfast, if he wins you leave. Aichi and his club let out a barking laugh. Very well. This is a magical fight, there are no rules. Naruto's eyes flared red as he dodged a sneak attack from an icicle. This is strictly a tojutsu fight, no other magic is allowed. Naruto said angrily. He drew his katana, or I will be forced to draw my blade. Aichi could feel Naruto's bloodlust permeating from the blade and gave his group the signal to back down. He could deal with this punk alone, pressing down on his cad, his body was enveloped in a yellowish coat. He shot forward with surprising speed, Naruto backpedaled slightly in surprise, Aichi clearly wasn't limited by the weight of his technique. He aimed a spinning back towards Naruto who simply dashed underneath it and aimed a capoeira-like sweep kick against his pivot foot, causing Aichi to stumble and tilt forwards. Naruto spun his body in a cartwheel-like fashion and delivered a powerful enhanced kick straight Aichi's ribcage. Crack. The veritable armor around him cracked, Aichi quickly compassed himself, you're using magic. He snarled. No, I'm not. Naruto replied. You're just a bad fighter without your little armor. Everyone snickered causing Aichi to get angry. He said, I I can beat you either way. He cut off his connection to Kaijin and dashed towards Naruto with a raised fist. Naruto simply ducked underneath the punch and delivered a wild hook straight into the boy's liver. Aichi's mouth bulged, he felt like he was going to puke from the pain of Naruto's body blow. Naruto picked the boy up and slammed him straight against the wall, you know I'm getting tired off having to deal with punks like you. I'm going to make this perfectly clear. He let out a tiny fraction of his chakra pure killing intent flooded the room, Aichi could barely breath from the intense pressure. It was like he was looking at a demon, like death itself had just entered the building. If you so much as try to bully anyone else in this school, I will make sure you never have the capacity to use magic again. His threat hung in the air as if it were a death sentence. Do you understand? Aichi nodded pathetically and Naruto let him go. Both of your clubs can coexist, Aichi's club can teach you how to fight using your magic in close combat situations, whereas Shinji's can't teach how to fight without magic. Learning both will make you all better fighters in the long run, you won't always be able to rely on magic. Silence reigned as Naruto made his way out of the room. Stop. Naruto halted as he felt someone raise their cat against him. Yuzumaki-san, you broke the rules. You are going to have come with me. Naruto stood his ground, what Onabi, are you so eager to have our rematch? He held his blade as tightly as possible. Are you resisting? You broke school rules and now you are threatening the head of the public moral committee. That is grounds for expulsion, Yuzumaki. Naruto bared his teeth, a moral committee that can't even maintain the moral of its own people, isn't something I wish to obey. You all speak about enforcement, yet you turn a blind eye to all of the discrimination that goes on to this school. His eyes flashed red in complete rage, if you think that I am going to apologize and beg to retain my place at this school all the while you endure such activity, you are dead wrong. Mary snarled, you threatened to destroy a person's life just because he was bullying another student. How are you any different? I merely gave him a warning, and it seems to have caused the exact reaction that I wanted. Hatred only breeds more hatred, and I'm sure as you will soon realize some weeds are willing to do whatever it takes to get justice. He continued, are you really willing to watch your classmates turn into your enemies? Could you stand yourself, what Anubi if you had to kill these people? Mary froze, her grip on her cad became lax as she watched Naruto walk past her. She wanted to stop him, but she couldn't, he was right. It was only a matter of time before someone did something worse, all for the sake of this rivalry as a result of admission scores. She spun around, what would have me do, Yuzu Naruto. Naruto stood by the door, either allow the rivalry to continue or remove the root cause of it. Create an environment where weeds are no longer weeds, but rather buds that are ready to blossom. He said, I'm still not familiar with the Japanese system of magic, but if this school is any indication of society as whole, I can understand why you have to deal so much with internal attacks. Mary frowned lightly as Naruto disappeared through the door leading into the gymnasium. She barely had any time to dwell as Tetsuya called in an attack on another Course 2 student, something had to be done, and Mary would be damned if she wasn't the one to abolish the system. Only as she would find out, it was quite hard to change a system where half of the school benefited. Are you sure, Fujibayashi? Kazama Harunobu said with a tightened smile. 
the current commander of the 101 Independent Magic Equipped Battalion, had been called in to survey the use of magic to assassinate Daichi. I'm afraid so. Fujibayashi said solemnly. The sniper worked alone most likely, and by the lack of security footage, it can be assumed he used either invisible type magic or some form teleportation to leave. The Zama hummed, it seems we have a new player amongst us. Ujibayashi nodded. Perhaps Tetsuya will have better luck. He's already here. Kazama said, pointing to the terrace where Fujibayashi believed the sniper to have taken aim from. Tetsuya walked into the room and saluted, Colonel. The Zama greeted, Special Officer. As Fujibayashi concluded correctly, there are no magical traces left behind by the sniper. Fujibayashi frowned, so there is no possible way to find the culprit. Tetsuya shook his head, he passed Fujibayashi the shell casing. Look at the pattern at the bottom of the casing. Fujibayashi's eyes widened at the black lotus pattern, it can't be I thought they were a myth. Apparently not. Though I must admit, I am not familiar with this black lotus. Bazama said, the black lotus is a myth, the mark of a group of assassins that are capable of killing anyone anywhere. He picked up the casing and inspected it, I'm sure you have all heard about the hidden arctic war. Both Tetsuya and Fujibayashi nodded. There was a time during that conflict that the new Soviet Union were winning each and every one of their miniature battles with the Uzna. The genius of Alexei was so much that he managed to kill William Sirius. However, that all changed when Alexei and his entire battalion were massacred in the dead of the night. Some suspected the Uzna hired the Black Lotus, whilst others believed it was the doing of a strategic class magician. It does seem unlikely that a lone assassin could cause such damage. Tetsuya said. And yet our agents in Moscow have uncovered that there wasn't a single instance of magical use either used against or by the Soviet forces. Tetsuya felt out of depth here, an unknown element capable of slaughtering an entire battalion of highly trained magicians, and to do it without the use of magic, made it even more frightening. The three of them remained silent as they all pondered the same thing. What did this organization want? Tetsuya didn't care for their motivation, if they indeed had sent an operative into the city and were seemingly interested in disrupting the already tense political balance between magicians and citizens, he was sure that they would sooner or later come for them soon. That put his school at risk, his sister at risk. If this assassin was foolish enough to attempt such a thing, he would erase them from existence. Unfortunately for Tetsuya, the threat was much closer to home than he could have ever anticipated. Naruto Uzumaki to club headquarters. I repeat will Naruto Uzumaki head over to club headquarters. Naruto sighed as he heard the announcement through the PAS system, he had anticipated that he would be reprimanded about what had happened yesterday, but couldn't they just wait until tomorrow. School was over and he had better things to do than listen to a lecture about morals. Erika asked, they called for you as well. Naruto raised an eyebrow at that, Erika clarified, Tetsuya's already there. Apparently, there was an incident between the Kendo and Kenjutsu Club. What did you do? Naruto stood up abruptly, I had a fight with Aichi Rikimaru. Erika's eye widened at his admission, um that Rikimaru. You fought the little giant. Naruto chuckled, he wasn't so much a giant as an annoying pest. Erika watched as Naruto left the room and groaned in disappointment. I forgot to ask him about his Kenjutsu. There was something about that technique that reminded her about her brother's own illusion blade, though Naruto's attack seemed to be even more elaborate and unstoppable. She frowned lightly, who are you Yuzumaki Naruto? Naruto arrived at the small building located in the corner of the campus, the school's club headquarters stood gracefully alone, and unlike the majority of the school it looked ancient as if it was built in the early 2000s. Naruto made his way to the reception, I was called here. The receptionist nodded and pointed him towards a red door, Naruto muttered a quick thank you before heading through the red doors. His eyes narrowed immediately as he saw the three people sitting behind the long table at the back of the room. The school's so-called triumvirate, each of them representing their organizations. To his right, the student body president, Sagusa Mayumi followed by Mary sitting in the center. Naruto had never met the last member, but he was particularly well known throughout Japan, the next leader of the Juumanji family and user of the infamous clan's phalanx, Juumanji Katsudo sat on his left. Mayumi said, Ah Yuzumaki-san, I had thought that you had missed the announcement. She turned to Tetsuya, if that is all Tetsuya-kun the boy merely bowed and made his way out of the room, never casting Naruto a look as he walked past him. He really was as emotionless as a robot, Naruto thought. What do you people want? Naruto asked neutrally. Yuumanji grunted in annoyance, we were notified by several students about what happened in the gymnasium. Mary confirmed it. He sighed, how long? Mayumi looked at him in confusion, how long? How long am I being suspended for? Naruto said. The three committee leaders looked at each other in slight surprise, I assume that's why I was brought here right. Mary smirked, whilst we are indeed powerful, Naruto. We don't possess the power to suspend a student that is up to the disciplinary committee and the principal. 
Naruto felt himself sigh in relief and Mary leant forward from her seat, I wouldn't relax if I were you. We still haven't decided whether we should report this to the principal. Naruto said, do as you wish. Maybe getting expelled would get Anderson Jiji to ask him to return to the Uzna. Though he doubted that old fart would actually allow it, he'd probably get him to join another organization in Japan. Itsudo narrowed his eyes, he had never met someone that was so lax about getting potentially expelled from school. He said, how about you tell us why you decided to fight Rikimaru-san. Naruto shrugged, Shinji and Itsuchi approached me outside and told me they wanted me to join their club. I only went with them because they mentioned that magical sports clubs often like to bully their non-magical counterparts. It doesn't help that the majority of non-magical clubs are often filled with course 2 students. Itsudo said, so you were looking for a fight then. Naruto growled, I was there to defend or stop anyone that interrupted the mixed martial arts demonstration. Rikimaru and his group of idiots decided it would be a good idea to try and take over the lunch slot, even though they were given after school time slot to demonstrate. Mayumi hummed appreciatively, and why did you threaten him after? Do you really think he was going to stop even after he was beaten? Naruto took their silence as an admission that they believed him. Now if that's all, I have a meeting that I need to attend to. Itsudo stood up, we aren't done here. Yes, we are. And just before Juumanji could summon his phalanx to stop Naruto from leaving, he summoned an acceleration activation sequence and sped out of the room. The triumvirate sat silently in the now empty room, surprise was marred on their faces at Naruto's blatant disrespect. Mary said, I told you this was a waste of time. Mayumi looked at Mary intensely, what are you not telling me? Mary stood from her seat, that's he was right to do what he did. She shifted through the papers and grabbed a large folder. I spent the whole of my free period going through every report made by the public moral committee since we started. 90% of all incidents involved a bloom attacking a weed. Surely you jest. Kitsudo replied. Mary passed him the folder, have at it. Kitsudo barely had to go through a dozen reports before he saw the glaring similarities of each of the incidents. He clicked his tongue, this wasn't good, no if this got out and became public news the damage done to the school would be irreversible. Who have you shown this to? He asked. Nobody. Mary said. And you want. Mary had never seen Kitsudo so serious, his gaze was rooted firmly on the open door. I think it's time we figure out a way to resolve this issue, don't you think? Mayumi said, but how? Mary grinned, I have an idea. If Naruto thought that she wouldn't get him back for what he did yesterday, he was dead wrong. Naruto shivered unconsciously as he walked home, he murmured to himself, why do I have the feeling that I just pissed someone off? He shrugged carelessly, believing that he could handle anything that came his way. You're late. Naruto snorted as he saw a shadow move from the corner of his eyes. I thought assassins were always on time. You try going to school and let's see if you can manage to always come on time. The shadow hopped out of the ground and stood before Naruto. Mars. Naruto greeted. The middle-aged man appeared as he always did, dressed as if he was attending some sort of business meeting. Naruto had met Mars during his second mission, the man had gotten injured and had lost his chance to get into the stars. Naruto recruited him as one of the many informants that worked for the Oni, he even gifted him an ancient form of shadow magic to reduce the burden of traveling with a shattered leg. Mars said, my contacts in the underworld have informed that they are on the move. He passed him a dossier, Naruto grabbed it and began to read its contents. So, they've moved up their schedule. He narrowed his eyes, this is. Yes, they are targeting first high school. Naruto chuckled, I didn't think the Blanche were that foolish. He passed the folder back to Mars, and what about the Yakuza branch in the city? They are no more. Mars said. What hope does a non-magical organization have against a shadow? By the end of the month, the entire underground of the Kanto region will be mine to control. He said with a grin. And what about Miss Sayuri? Mars questioned. I have plans for her. Anderson Jiji had sent him to infiltrate the first high school, Naruto would do one better, he had plans to topple the country's regime. He believed wholeheartedly that magicians would either need to be incorporated into society as a whole, instead of just weapons, or the next war wouldn't be between countries, it would be a war of the people. The Blanche were originally an activist group that would vigorously protest the new magical accords that are now adopted all across the world. The accords helped further the already unfair wage and power gap between civilians and magicians, soon after, magicians began to seed themselves into the political systems of countries which only helped further the divide. The Blanche seeing that their protests were being ignored, adopted a more guerrilla approach under their new leader. They began by infiltrating smaller countries in Africa and Asia, and soon enough they had established a sophisticated network around the world. The new leader of the organization was a pragmatic man who simply cared about profits and power, his workers on the other hand joined because they believed in the cause of dismantling the discrimination of civilians. 
Garrido snorted, if only they knew that their poor leader was one of the richest and most influential men in all of Asia. Naruto found himself wondering why the Blanche were so interested in Japan anyway, he had a feeling that Great Asian Union was behind it. Mars said, if that will be all I must return to the office. Say hi to old lady Rita for me. Naruto shouted as Mars dissolved once more into the ground, it was always surprised him what Fuinjutsu could do to enhance the functions of magic. Attention, all students. We are a volunteer coalition seeking to abolish the discrimination within the school. We demand an opportunity to negotiate on equal terms with the Student Council and the Extracurricular Activities Federation. The broadcast ended as abruptly as it started leaving the students in the school confused about what had just happened. Naruto watched as Tetsuya ran out of the room, he smirked lightly, knowing that this would end badly for the so-called volunteer group. Though, they had accomplished what they wanted in the first place. By bringing their issues into the light, they had pretty much forced the issue out of the student body's hands and into that of the school board. True to his assumption, Mayumi made an announcement that an open forum would be held tomorrow at the Great Hall. The open forum was an easy way for the board to show that they were taking a step in the right direction and that in time, these differences would fade. Excuse me Naruto turned to see a rather short girl pass him a sheet, he noted the bracelet around her wrist and it forced him to wonder whether the students wearing them knew what the meaning behind it was. It's important that all course 2 students attend tomorrow's open forum. She said. He nodded and took the letter with a polite smile, the girl quickly moved on to giving the sheet to other students. Naruto. A shrill noise erupted from behind him, Naruto immediately jumped to his side to stop Erika from jumping on him. What do you want? He questioned. You missed battle magic class today she said with a huff, Jin sensei paired me up with Shizuku, that emotionless robot. I'm pretty sure she took out all her frustration on me. He chuckled sheepishly, I had a doctor's appointment. Are you okay? She asked, Naruto thought she was surprisingly worried about someone that she rarely interacted with. I'm fine. It's just an old injury resurfacing is all. He clarified as he walked towards the entrance gate, Erika took a quick look at him, and Naruto noted the glimmer of suspicion in her eyes. Anyway, I'm sure you didn't come here to chat. So. Teach me. Sorry. Teach me, Kinjutsu. Erika said. No. Naruto replied almost nonchalantly. Erika was not one to beg, in fact, she never begged for anything, but learning that kinjutsu technique meant more to her than keeping her pride. Please you can just teach me that technique if you want. She said whilst pouting. Naruto laughed at her face, Erika was neither cute nor innocent enough to pull off that puppy-eyed look. She growled and kicked him in the shin, what's so funny? He laughed, no it's just your face. He couldn't stop himself from laughing even more as she continued to hit him. Naruto eventually snapped out of it, seriously though, I can't teach you that technique even if I wanted to. What? Why? I thought you said it was just a samurai technique. Naruto muttered, you forget how long it takes to become a samurai, let alone learn one of their more powerful techniques. Erika looked almost downtrodden at his admission, she had finally found something that she could use to show her father that she didn't need to know Chiba main family techniques to become a master kinjutsu. Naruto had seen that look many times, a look of neglect and need for approval demon brat. He winced as a flash of a new memory rippled through his mind. What it meant he didn't know. All he knew was that he felt a powerful urge to help the girl beside him. How about we start off with something a little simpler? Erika stood there frozen as Naruto continued to walk, he looked back at her teasingly, having second thought. She quickly snapped out of her thoughts with a bright smile, where are we going? I know a place. The day of the forum quickly arrived. Half the school was congregated in the auditorium, which was surprisingly more than Naruto or Mayumi had anticipated. Unsurprisingly however was that the course 2 students attending outnumbered the course 1 students by 2 to 1, as a result of this, there was an even greater tension between students. The public moral committee members looked like they were on edge as if they were expecting an attack all of a sudden. Someone had already told them about the Blanche movement in the school, and they weren't being very subtle about it either. Compared to the Course 1 students, the treatment received by Course 2 students is both inferior and discriminatory in every way. The speaker for the Course 2 student was taking an aggressive stand about what he believed were the root cause of the divide, perhaps ignoring the most important aspect. Teaching. Naruto couldn't believe that not once did he touch on teaching, it was in fact the greatest issue in the school. Due to a lack of teaching facilities, Course 2 students were left without a teacher, and as such were pretty much forced to self-study under the direction of guided online lectures, and whilst this may be satisfactory to some. The lack of contact time and facilities available to them resulted in a sharp contrast between final exams. It was as if being a Course 2 student had their chance of getting into magical university, it was simply an unfair policy. Mayumi took to the stage, effectively dismantling her opponent's already weak argument. 
she delivered a powerful speech about equality and the like, without ever introducing a plan of action or addressing any important issues herself. It was simply her speech was simply an appeal to emotion, and it seemingly worked, all the students slowly began to stand on their feet and applaud the student council president. Boom. Right on time. A huge explosion rocked the school, causing the students to quickly take up arms. The eagle-eyed affiliated students tried to escape the building, but they were quickly apprehended by Mary and her group. Crash. The sound of glass and the sound of an grenade bouncing of the ground echoed throughout the hall, the smoke grenade flickered before it began spewing white toxic gas. Don't breathe in the smoke. Hattori shouted, he raised his hand in time to activate a convergence and movement type spell that effectively isolated the gas and the grenade from the environment. Hattori threw the gas grenade out of the broken window. The small amount of reprieve granted by his actions was quickly interrupted by the timely arrival of three armed men into the hall. Naruto muttered, that's my cue. Tetsuya saw a flicker of blonde hair speeding past him, he frowned slightly, wondering why Naruto was delving deeper into the school, instead of helping them to fight. Surely, he had nothing to do with this right. Tetsuya barely had any time to reflect on his thoughts as more gunfire began to ring from the courtyard. So, they truly were after something else and they were using the students as a distraction. Naruto grinned as he rushed through the hallways, dodging several bullets from a pair of gunmen who had spotted him. He drew a kunai out of his pocket and threw it with perfect aim, it landed right in his eye. The other gunman stepped back in fear as Naruto began to approach him. He raised his rifle with shaky arms and began to spray, only to find Naruto had practically vanished. Naruto appeared suddenly behind him, his palm on the man's head. Ninjendo. He muttered, rinchering and blazing to life. He lifted his arm with it the man's mind and spirit, effectively absorbing everything into himself. Damn this guy's life really sucks. He muttered to himself as he skimmed his memories for the intel he wanted. Found you. He grabbed his phone and dialed a number, Sayuri I know where Hajim is. That's goo. Bang. Naruto heard a huge another huge explosion from Sayuri's side, she groaned in pain. They're here how did they find us? Dch. The bastard Hajim had planned a double-pronged attack, he must have gotten wind off what happened with the Yakuza branch, and since Sayuri's organization was his only other competition, he more than likely blamed her for the attack. Naruto grimaced, he would have to leave Hajim for now. He activated his Kamui and disappeared in a spiral, never noticing the lone red eyes peer around the corner in time to see him teleport. The school was a warzone, complete and utter chaos erupted from the school grounds as dozens of students clashed with mask intruders. Tetsuya and Miyuki had effectively quelled the main force by infiltrating the library and stopping them from completing the data transfer that they were so eager to acquire. With the defeat of their main forces, it was rather easy for the other students to round up the rest and capture them before they cordoned the school. It was now almost dusk, Tetsuya and his group had met up with Mary, Kitsudo and Mayumi in order to question Mibu Sayaka. Sayaka who had played a pivotal role in both the announcement and the invasion, appeared defeated and disappointed with herself. For over a year, Captain Kimono has been exhorting the Kendo team to bring about an end to discrimination by magic. She admitted she knew that she had no choice but come out clean, but Tetsuya wasn't sure whether this was out of guilt or a desire to appear innocent so that she could get a reduced punishment. The captain once lured me to the Blanche branch office as well. Apparently, his older brother is the head of the Japan branch, not long after enrolling here, there was an incident in which I was discriminated against as a course 2 student, I think that's why I listened so intently to what the captain had to say. Tetsuya asked, what kind of incident was it? Um. Her eyes darted around the room out of embarrassment, the Kenjutsu team had caused a disturbance, recruiting, and I saw Ms. Watanabe's, and it took my breath away. So right away, I asked if she would take me on and advise me, but she just coldly brushed me off. Mary appeared to be slightly surprised by the accusation, is that true, Mibu? Mibu continued, you said, you're no match for me, so it would be a waste of time. Go pick out an opponent you're worthy of. I assumed it was probably because I was a course 2 student. And I guess that kind of pushed me towards. Mary quickly interjected, hey, hold up. If I recall correctly, this is what I told you that day. With my skills, I could never hope to be a match for you. It would be better if you practiced with someone worthy of your skills. Am I wrong? Mibu appeared to be slightly conflicted with Mary's recollection. She felt as if her memory was a tad bit off. Mayumi asked, so this was all caused by a simple misunderstanding. Mary nodded, I may be the better mage, but her swordmanship far exceeds my own, it would pointless for her to fight me. I don't believe this. I'm such an idiot. Sayaka began to cry. I shouldn't have jumped to conclusions, if I hadn't maybe all of this wouldn't have happened. They all felt bad for her, even Tetsuya could sympathize despite being unable to feel the crushing emotions that she was being overwhelmed by. 
He clicked his tongue, he had enough of this farce to begin with. Someone needed to destroy the Blanche once and for all. There is no use dueling on what ifs and maybes we must deal with the more immediate threat. Everyone turned to him, the question we should be asking is where are the Blanche at the moment? Hitsaya, don't tell me you're planning to take them on in battle. Mayumi asked in shock. That is not an appropriate choice of words. A dark bloodthirsty aura spiraled out of him as he said, I'm going to destroy them. Hitsaya. It's too risky. Mary said angrily, you're not just overstepping your boundaries as a student, but you're also putting your life on the line. Mayumi agreed with her friend's point of view, stating that it should be left for the police. Hitsaya replied, if we leave it to the police it will be mean that we have to report Ms. Mibu for attempted robbery. Yuumanji grunted, I see then police intervention is undesirable. That said, I'm afraid we can't simply let this go. He looked at Tetsaya, however we are against a group of terrorists. Neither I, nor Sagusa, nor Watanabe would ask his students here to risk their lives. Of course, you wouldn't. Tetsaya replied cautiously, from the start, I never intended to turn to the student council or the extracurricular activities fed for help. Are you planning to go on your own? Tetsaya nodded as if it was just commonplace to waltz into a building filled with armed criminals. Though seemingly that was out of the question when Miyuki, Leo and Erika volunteered to join. Shiba-kun, if you're doing this for me, I'm begging you to please stop. I'll be fine. I know I should be punished for what I did. She fidgeted with her fingers in slight guilt, but if something were to happen to you all because of me. That Saya interrupted, I'm not doing this for you. His reply almost felt cold and caused Sayaka to feel even more small. The zone in which I live has been targeted by anyone tries to ruin my daily life, and Miyuki's, I will eradicate them all. For me, that is my highest priority. He finished firmly, leaving Sayaka no room to argue. She sighed in defeat, if you all are keen on going you should probably know one other thing. Hitsaya turned to her, from my very limited knowledge the attack was meant to take place months from now. I heard Captain Kimono arguing with his brother last week about some masked figure. Mary asked, masked figure. Sayaka said, all I know is that this masked figure has them spooked. Hitsaya replied, that is of no consequence to us. If this masked figure turned up, he would eliminate him all the same. Blood it was everywhere, flowing around the entire hideout like a small river. Sayuri had never seen such a massacre before, Naruto had arrived and effectively eliminated 30 Blanche soldiers armed with anti-night with imperceptible ease. Red eyes turned to her, Hajim believed that you were responsible for the attacks on the Yakuza. He sought to attack you before you supposedly attacked him. Sayuri growled in an unladylike manner, when I get my hands on that bastard. A powerful fire flickered around her body, its presence barely visible, but the heat was already immense. I'm going to skin him and send his remains back to his master. Naruto winced slightly as he felt memories of his clone enter his mind, I don't think that's going to be possible. Someone's already beaten us to the punch. Boo. Sayuri glowered. Naruto gulped as she glared at him with enough intensity to burn him to ash. He told her that Tetsuya and company were currently fighting their way through the Blanche members. Sayuri gave him a teasing smirk, how about we crash that party, Naruto-kun. Naruto grinned bloodthirstily, I thought you'd never ask. I'm curious what this man knows anyway. The pair disappeared in a vortex whirl, leaving only dead bodies and fearful subjects in their wake. Hajim ran to the door in fear of the two monsters that annihilated his whole security, why? He screamed. How can you use magic even under cast jamming? Hitsaya merely sneered at the cowering man as he tried to open the door, only to stumble back in fear when a loud sonic blade began to cut the door in half. Hirahara walked through the broken door, he looked around the room in slight appreciation. Hey, not too shabby, big bro Shiba. Kirihara said. He stared at the pitiful man on the ground, so who's this dude? Hitsaya said, the leader of Blanche, Hajim Tsukasa. Kirihara drew his blade, rage clearly echoed from his voice, that's him. It's him. The bastard who duped Mibu. Hajim raised his arm in protest, but Kirihara merely swung his blade down, intent on maiming the bastard as much as he could. Plang. Kirihara jumped in surprise as his blade was diverted by a kunai. Who is there? The masked man appeared suddenly in the room, Tetsuya barely had any time to respond, as the man raised his arms and whispered, Shinra Tensei. That was when all hell broke loose. Two words. Tetsuya couldn't comprehend how two simple words were capable of such devastation, he remembered watching the figure land, or should he say appear next to Hajim, palms outstretched in a pushing motion. Shinra Tensei. An almighty force was expelled, the world around it stood no chance as it spiraled and struck against everything with the force of a miniature missile. The catastrophic technique decimated half of the building, destroying everything in its way, Tetsuya was no exception when he felt the force rupture the earth below him and throw him straight into several pieces of jagged rubble. He groaned in pain, blood rushing out from his mouth. 
ruptured spleen several broken bones pierced lung. He blurrily looked up from his position and saw two people standing next to the unconscious Hajim. Titsaya couldn't see them in detail, dust and shimmering light flickering all around the now open building. The damage that the man had done, he had blown half of the building apart, sending everything flying in every direction. His mind flickered to the events before the mysterious figure's arrival, and he immediately became concerned for Kirihara. And yet he couldn't see him, feel him he wondered if he was dead. As the dust settled and his vision cleared more, he could see them more clearly and couldn't help but notice the difference in their stature. The woman was dressed in a long traditional dress, her upper face covered by a silver mask, she stood there regal and proud. The masked man was dressed in pure black armor, the type of armor that was used by army magicians to effectively stop armor piercing round and lower ranked magic. Though the masked figure's interesting feature lay behind his kitsune mask, red concentric eyes spun furiously, a stark contrast to the figure's laid-back stance. The masked man said, I'm sorry I can't let you take him. Tetsuya's eyes began to close as his mind instinctively activated regrowth, rewinding the damage done to his body back to what it was before the attack. The damage wasn't so bad all it took was a mere few seconds before he regenerated completely. Bani sama Tetsuya's eyes snapped open in shock as Miyuki screamed and rushed to his side. She raised her cat in pure rage, I'll kill you. She roared. The masked woman laughed sadistically, I'll take the girl. But Tetsuya wouldn't allow anyone near his sister, he aimed his pistol at her and fired Miss Dispersion at her. The black orb appeared immediately in front of her and expanded into a cocoon-like structure surrounding Sayuri. Naruto clicked his tongue, now now. You didn't think I would allow you to erase my partner, did you? The cocoon cracked and released an angry Sayuri. If you put me in that thing again I will vaporize you. She snarled, smoldering fire rippled from her feet and danced towards the pair of siblings on the ground. Miyuki stood up straight, raising her cat, and an icy blast rippled away from her. The resultant clash of ice and fire released an immense amount of steam, Tetsuya quickly grabbed his sister and jumped out of the way when he felt a spike in energy. The high-pitched sonic screech echoed through the steam, Tetsuya and Miyuki watched as a blue energy shuriken struck their previous position. It burst into a small explosion, Tetsuya immediately raised his gun and used Miss Dispersion to stop it from expanding any further, yet all his technique did was seemingly cause to implode even more vigorously. Tetsuya and Miyuki were launched into the rubble once more by the sheer concussive force from the blast, Tetsuya groaned in pain as he watched the two figures emerge from the dust and steam. Miyuki muttered, Ani-sama what do we do? Tetsuya mouthed, find the others. He needed her out of the way if he was going to be able to fight without having to worry about her. Miyuki nodded and rushed towards into what remained of the Blanche headquarters, her path was cut off by a powerful streak of lightning that spiraled from the sky. The woman grinned, where do you think you're going, little girl? Tetsuya raised his twin silver horns and aimed one at her, but was quickly forced to disengage when wooden roots began to erupt from the ground and grabbed his foot. Let the girls have their fun. Tetsuya fired a mist dispersion at him and the other at the root wrapped around his foot. The black orbs once more came to his rescue, effectively blocking the attack without taking any damage. I don't have a choice I have to use it. He closed his eyes for a single moment as he activated his elemental sight. What he saw was nothing short of an impossibility. Pure energy, it was as if the man was simply emitting the energy as if he was a solar battery. This man wasn't using magic, or rather his ability to affect the world didn't involve the manipulation of idos, he was simply using this unknown energy to cause the effect that he wanted. Worse yet, his elemental sight couldn't decode what the energy was and why it seemed so resistant to his misdispersion. Find something interesting. The figure ran towards him, hands blurring in signs before Tetsuya felt an immense spike in energy. Ton. Riktai no Jutsu. He let out a tremendous stream of wind, Tetsuya jumped back in interest as he watched the wind begin to spiral and form into a dragon-like apparition. The figure quickly sped through another set out hand signs, breathing in as he let out a similar stream of air, but this time the dragon was set alight. The combination of wind and fire proved to be almost unbearable, the heat of the technique literally melting the metal and glass shards on the ground. It seemed to almost roar as it came thundering down to him, Tetsuya narrowed his eyes as he analyzed how the technique worked, he could see how the energy was simply being converted into what the man wanted it to be. But there was something else, it was as if the energy was made up of two different components that melded together in exactly the right quantity to form such a malleable form of energy. He raised his gun and aimed it at the roaring dragon of fire and wind that was heading his way and activated his mist dispersion, this time aiming for the energy source in itself and dispersing it into its constitutive elements. Interestingly, his technique didn't explode this time, but instead seemingly dispersed into two separate wisps of energy, one bright and the other dark. Like yin and yang. He thought to himself. He raised his gun once more, this time a small smirk played on his lips. 
He had finally broken past the first barrier to defeating this man, and yet the mysterious man simply stood there, clapping his hand in applause. Bravo. Bravo. You're much keener than I thought you were. He spoke, his tone was jovial and mocking as if he had been expecting it. That Saya raised his gun, only to find himself being launched into the air by a gut-wrenching punch. He quickly enhanced himself with a Sion coat to block the impact of a downward kick that sent him spiraling into the ground. But you are still human, after all. The figure floated above him, so weak, so pathetically vulnerable. He dove down to the earth, a spiraling blue of bull energy grew in his palm, Tatsaya grabbed his second gun from his waist as he allowed himself to be struck by the ball of energy. Pain erupted from his midsection, the earth below him cracked as he felt himself being pushed down into the ground from the sheer power of the technique. All it took was one good shot. Miss Dispersion wasn't limited by walls or physical boundaries, he spun the gun behind his back and pointed it at the figure. He fired. It was relatively painless, easy, almost impossibly so. The figure was there one moment and the next simply wasn't. Now to deal with the last pest. He turned to see Miyuki being driven back by several powerful streams of lightning and fire, the woman was extremely aggressive with her magic, and it worked in her favor, as Miyuki was unable to respond, at least, until she had access to her full power. Hitsaya raised his gun and aimed it at the woman. Slink. The black blade ruptured through his chest, he heard a growl from behind him, that hurt, you bastard. Blood splurged from his mouth, the small hole in his chest blew open to form a gaping wide hole, Tetsaya fell to the ground, body numb as he felt himself on the verge of unconsciousness. Blurry eyes saw the unmistaken form of the masked man walking to his sister. No. He had to save her. And yet it was too late, he was too weak to keep himself from raising his gun, no, it wasn't that he was too weak, his body simply shut itself down to activate regrowth. And with one last breath, his eyes shuddered closed and he fell unconscious. Self-repair, spell auto start. Horido's data, reading from backup. Load magic sequence. Error data corruption. Reanalyzing Korido's data. Complete. This cycle continued as Tetsaya's body continued to try and heal itself from the continuous cellular damage that blade stuck in him was causing. Meanwhile. Miyuki raised another ice wall to stop another barrage of flames from turning her to ash, frustration and fatigue, quickly settling in. This battle was going nowhere and by the looks of it, this woman wasn't going to run out of stamina anytime soon. She had to use it. She had no choice. Raising her palm, a chilling cold erupted from it and spread towards the woman. She stood no chance, the world around her remained normal, but the masked woman was simply frozen. Cossetus, it was called. The forbidden magic that could freeze someone's very soul, it was unstoppable, irreversible and the only ability that could kill her Ani Isama. And yet, there he was, her precious brother on the ground, a black blade speared onto his back, he wasn't moving. Miyuki felt tears drip from her face, rage erupted from inside her as her magic spread far and wide throughout the entire building, freezing the world around her. Clap clap. I see you disabled my partner. The masked man began to walk towards her, his hand merely touching the frozen woman's shoulder, Miyuki felt herself crumble to the ground out of shock as the masked woman's body returned to normal. Her magic had held no consequence to this man. Oh, you are so going to regret doing that. I'm going to skin you alive. Fire bellowed from the woman's feet and spiraled towards her. Miyuki raised her cad and fired an icy blast towards her, but the woman merely grinned as she raised a device and pressed a simple button. Sions erupted from her body like a cyclone enveloping the fire and causing it to roar to life, it was so hot that it melted the metal around her. Miyuki felt fear grip her body as she continued to try and stop the flow of the fire, but it was no use, it was as if it was simply eating her magic up and using it as fuel to grow. She was going to die here. As it inched closer and closer to her body, her skin began to burn just from its presence, her magic barely doing anything to stop the forthcoming storm of fire. Palinx. Juuminjo Kitsudo landed in front of Miyuki hands outstretched as he summoned a large rainbow-like shielding the size of a small van. The flame slammed into the shield but did no damage, Miyuki couldn't even feel the heat. Kitsudo looked back, are you alright, Shiba-san? She nodded slightly. Who are these people? He asked. Miyuki murmured, I I don't know. She remembered her brother's prone body and the way the mysterious man easily countered her Cossetus, even if it wasn't at full power. But they're dangerous. Hitsudo muttered, it's a good thing, I brought back up then. He needed to act fast or else there may be more lives in danger. Using his phalanx, he expanded it across the range of the fire, encompassing it all and simply causing it to extinguish releasing large amounts of water in the form of water vapor. Now Leo, Erica. He muttered through his comms. Dch these pests keep coming and coming. The masked woman said. She raised her hand and summoned a large amount of fire to attack Miyuki and Kitsudo. Answer. 
She heard a roar from above her as Leo came down from the ceiling alongside Erica, ready to attack these unknown perpetrators. The masked man merely raised his hand and muttered, Shinra Tensei. An immense blast of gravity sent the two of them flying straight into Juumanji and Miyuki. We need to go. He warned. The masked woman moaned in disappointment, but I was having so much fun. But the now nearing sounds of police sirens and helicopters forced them to leave. Yuumanji said, you're not going anywhere. A glowing shield erected around the two of them, the masked woman whistled impressively as she felt her magic flicker on and off. So, this is the phalanx. Juumanji looked at the silent masked man who had simply moved to grab Hajim. How about an exchange? A vortex spiraled from in front of him, and out came an unconscious and heavily bleeding Kirihara. His life for Hajim's. He took his silence as him accepting the deal the masked man didn't even wait for Juumanji to take down his phalanx before he grabbed his partner and Hajim, whisking them away in a vortex. Erika asked, did he just Katsudo nodded, his gaze firmly on the spot that the attackers were, it was teleportation, and one that managed to bypass the anti-magic field of his phalanx. This was bad, really bad. He moved to check on Kirihara, whilst Miyuki was already sprinting towards the prone body of her brother. A thankful smile played on her lips as she felt his body activate regrowth and heal him. Brown eyes flickered open, and Tatsaya let out a strangled gasp, what would happened, Miyuki. Miyuki held him in a tight hug as she murmured, you're alive you're alive. Tatsaya held his sister in his arms whilst she sobbed. He felt angry Moreso at himself for allowing this to happen, but also at his attackers. What did they want? Who were they? Tatsaya couldn't quite help but feel as though he knew the mysterious man. Sirens began to bellow as soon the police began to surround the area and interrogate them. Thankfully, Juumanji Senpai was able to use his status as an heir to one of the Ten Master clans to stop the police from taking them into custody. Kirihara was taken to the hospital, Juumanji forced Itsaya to get himself checked up. Erika asked, what happens now? Itsaya shook his head, I don't know. They had taken Hajim, managed to defeat him and his sister if his aunt had gotten wind of what happened here. He had no doubt that the repercussion would go far and wide. I hope you are ready, you just waged war against the Itsuba clan. He certainly would be the next time they met. Mayasama. There's been an incident. Maya frowned intensely as her butler, Hayama Tadanori rushed into the room. He detailed the events that had taken place a few hours prior, how Tatsaya had defeated the Blanche leader, only for them to become attacked by two masked perpetrators. Is Miyuki alright? Yes, Juumanji sama saved her using his phalanx. Or at least that was he told during his report. She clicked her tongue, and what of Tatsaya? Ayama muttered, Juumanji only recalled that Tatsaya was unconscious during that time, he didn't see the majority of the fight. Maya had never heard of such feats, a man capable of manipulating gravity, teleportation, and could disable her precious weapon. This couldn't bode well for her or the entirety of the master clans. Have you spoken to Tatsaya? Ayama frowned, he was not very forthcoming about details, but he did say that the man had managed to survive his misdispersion. Maya's eyes widened in shock, the teacup almost fell from her grasp. Are you sure? As far as I can tell there is no other reason to believe that Tatsaya can lose even if he was fighting with his limiter on. The butler said. Maya muttered, go. I need to be alone. Hayama bowed and exited the room, Maya threw her cup at the door in frustration. First Belarus, then Daichi and now she learned that neither Tatsaya nor Miyuki's magic was as formidable as she believed it to be. It was as if this person or persons were toying with her, taking her plans apart bit by bit. She had to go on the offensive, even if it compromised their hidden identity. It was time she reminded the world why the Itsuba were known as the untouchables. Sayuri pushed Naruto off her as they returned to her base, you could have killed them why didn't you? She growled. You even let that boy live. Naruto narrowed his eyes, I could have also simply grabbed Hajim and left without any of them, even knowing I was there. And yet I let you have your fun, Sayuri. Sayuri sighed. Don't tell me you didn't see how powerful those two are, letting them grow any further isn't going to help our plans. Let's just say, I have plans for them as well. Sayuri couldn't help but wonder what his plans for them were, and though she wasn't satisfied with letting them, there wasn't much she could do anyway. Besides, if you're so thirsty for bloodshed, you'll get your fair share come sunrise. It was time that Naruto seized control of the criminal underground of the Kanto region. He picked up the unconscious Hajim and used Ninjendo to absorb his soul, he flicked through his memories, effectively learning each of his mannerisms and behavioral pattern. Sayuri looked at him with confusion, what do you mean? We have a meeting to attend. Wear something nice. He said as he channeled his chakra and used Hinge to transform into Hajim. Sayuri smirked, maybe, I'll get my fun anyway. Naruto gulped slightly when he felt her predatorial gaze roam over him, he had a feeling showing her his Hinge was going to bite him back in the ass. 
Every once in a while, there would be a large shift in power, and the many heads of the criminal underworld in Japan would meet to discuss what to do. The culling of the Yakuza and Hachioji and the slow movement of an unknown element had prompted Hajim to call a meeting with the remaining criminal leaders in the Kanto region in hopes that they could bound together to defeat this unknown enemy. However, an unknown tip that he had received the morning that he was planning to attack the first magic high school had given him the opportunity of a lifetime. If he could acquire the magic from the school and defeat this organization that was causing the underworld so much grief, he would be in a position to rule the region. Then he would finally be able to challenge his master. Unfortunately for him, he hadn't planned for the presence of Sayori and Naruto. Arrogance had always been a tactician's greatest weakness, not that Hajim was much of one, to begin with. The meeting was meant to take place in the mountains that surrounded Heijiachi, an abandoned yet somehow well-kept building hidden far from technology and view. It was the perfect place to conduct secret meetings. Hajim Sama. The security guard bowed as Naruto disguised as Hajim walked into the room. The room was plain and bare possessing only a table in the middle of the room. Naruto noted the seven men and women that sat comfortably on their seat, drinking tea and chatting among themselves as if they were all friends. But anyone with a keen mind would be able to observe the awkward mannerisms, the constant flickering of their gazes to their bodyguards. Sayori smirked, what do we want with these old farts anyway? Control, Naruto muttered. He sat on the allocated chair for the Blanche leader, gentlemen and women. He said. All of their heads turned towards him as he greeted them, none of them saw his flicker red. Mayumi Sagusa rushed to the hospital when she had heard what had happened, she had been against the idea of it, to begin with, but to learn that they had been attacked by an unknown force, made her all the more worried. What happened? She asked Yuamanji, seeing him speak with Mary. Yuamanji detailed what he had happened during their time attacking the Blanche base. I remember running towards Kirihara to stop him from killing Hajim when I felt something just blow everything apart. I lost consciousness and when I came around, Tetsuya and Miyuki were fighting these two mysterious people. I went to go look for the others, but I only found Chiba and Leonhard. He paused, frowning as he remembered how easily the night could have ended up with all of them dead. And they disappeared just as quickly as they came. Mary asked, disappeared. Yuamanji said, yes, the masked man he had this power that allowed him to teleport in some sort of vortex. Vortex. Mayumi whispered, her hands fell to her sides in slight shock. No. It couldn't be. Could it? The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.